Over the last couple of years, I built a company from about 30 people to nearly 1,000 people. And knowing that our people and who we hire would determine our performance and drive our success, I decided to interview every single person in the company that we hired. And that turned into a lot of interviews. <laughs> but it was really great, because I got to know every single person in the company, I knew everyone by name, and that really contributed to the positive and incredible culture that we built. Now, I can tell you a lot of interesting stories out of those interviews, and one in particular that stuck with me was I was interviewing this person for a finance role, and she was really experienced. And when it was her opportunity to ask questions to learn more about the company, she looked at me and she said, you know, I've worked for a lot of companies, big and small, and I've never met a CEO before, and I may never meet another CEO again. So can I ask you, what is it exactly that you do? I mean, what is your job? <laughs> and I looked at her, and on the spot I gave her this answer, and I've stuck with it ever since, that my job is to make sure that we're hiring the best people, that we're creating an environment where everyone could do what they do best every day, that I hold everyone to an equal and accountable standard, meaning there are no favorite people or favorite teams, and that I set the long-term strategy and vision for the organization. And with that approach, we built a company where over 50% of our managers were women, over 40% of our technical team members, <laughs> over 40% of our technical team members in roles like R&D were women, and I can tell you that absolutely our diversity drove our success and our culture. Unfortunately, our society more broadly isn't very equitable. I truly believe that we're each a product of the world that we're born into, and there just exist two completely and distinctly different worlds for men and women, for boys and girls, academically and professionally. And today we're gonna to talk about the scope of that problem, some of the underlying challenges that create this inequity, and some of the solutions that we can engage in individually and collectively along the way. And I wanna start by sharing with you this quote. Fighting supervillains is a cinch. Fighting misogyny is the real challenge. <laughs> That's the reality for most women. Doing the job is the easy part. It's dealing with the obstacles and the biases outside of that job that's the real challenge. Imagine graduating from college and landing your dream job at the top firm in your field. And your first assignment is to do a project for your beloved Dallas Cowboys. But when you show up with your team, you can't actually sit with your team. You're told you have to sit in the secretary pool or in a windowless closet because women weren't allowed to sit on that floor. That's a true story from a friend of mine. And we're not talking about the 60s or the 70s here. This was the mid to late 80s. Now, as much as I love the 80s, I know that feels like a long time ago. So let's take a look at what the world looks like today. Pretty powerful. I mean, in addition to just how clear the inequity is in these images, the other thing that struck me is just how global they are. We're not talking about a problem that impacts a small group of people in some corner of the world. We're talking about something that impacts half of the world's population. So what are the underlying challenges that create this inequity? In my view, there are three. The gatekeeper effect, unconscious bias, and pseudoscience. So let's talk about all three of these, starting with the gatekeeper effect. This is Britt Marling. She's an actress, a writer, and a director, and she wrote a really powerful piece in The Atlantic about her first encounter with Harvey Weinstein. Like a lot of young actresses, she thought she landed her big break, a meeting with Harvey Weinstein. She was supposed to meet him at a hotel bar, but when she arrived, she was told he was too busy to come downstairs, and she needed to go up and meet him in a suite. 
Reluctantly, she made her way up there and quickly found herself in a really difficult and compromising situation. What she actually writes about is her ability to get up and leave that situation. And in her own words, while it was the actress that walked into that meeting, it was the writer who was able to get up and leave. Because in her own mind, she knew she can control her own destiny. She knew because she was a writer and a creator that even if Harvey Weinstein never put her in a movie, she can create her own opportunities and chart her own path. And that's the challenge with these gatekeepers. They don't just trap you creatively, they trap you economically. And in these instances, they rob women of their agency, they rob them of their ability to consent, and they rob them of the opportunity to provide for themselves and for their families. So what can we learn from these stories? Well, first, we have to hold leaders accountable, and we have to hold them to a higher standard. We also have to understand consent in the context of power and make sure that we're educating around that and we're holding people accountable based on that understanding. We also have to realize that the lack of gender equity in today's society creates room for this sort of abuse of power to happen, and it's a great reminder of why we particularly need gender equity in positions of leadership. So how do we get into these positions of leadership? Well, one way is through entrepreneurship. So let's take a look at how venture capitalists evaluated male and female entrepreneurs in this two-year study of a Swedish venture capital fund. Now, if you're not familiar with venture capital, but you've seen Shark Tank, it's just like Shark Tank. <laughs> it's basically a group of people who decide which companies and which people to invest in. So if you are young and male and you presented to this group of VCs, you are considered young and promising. If you were young and female, you were perceived as young and inexperienced. And you generally don't want to give money to people you don't think know what they're doing. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Let's say you'd already raised money. You know, I have a background in venture capital. I can tell you that's a huge positive because it's a really big part of the job. If you were male and you'd raised money, you were a very competent innovator and you had money to play with. If you were female and you'd raise money, you were good looking and careless with money. Wow. This is the definition of bias. You have two groups with nearly identical attributes that are being perceived and treated very differently, purely based on their gender. And that bias has a real economic impact. In this study, women received only 25% of the funding amount they requested whereas the men received 52%, more than two times. And in a separate survey of technology companies, women were found to account for about one-third of the workforce of those companies and were thus one-third of the equity holders, but they only held 9% of the value of those companies, meaning that the men held 91% of the value. Think about that. What's the other way we get into these positions of leadership? Well, we get hired, we get promoted, we work our way up. So let's take a look at how unconscious bias impacts the hiring process. If you have a slate of candidates for a role and only one of them is female, she statistically has a 0% chance of getting that job. The same goes for minorities. If we increase that to two women, the odds go up to 50%. And the why here is really interesting. You see, our brains process difference as risk. So if you have one woman in that slate of candidates, even if she's the best person for the job, the interviewers may perceive her as the riskiest candidate. And what do hiring managers want to do? They want to mitigate or eliminate risk in the hiring process, so they might go with someone else. The second we add a second woman into that candidate pool, her gender no longer stands out, it gets no longer translated as a risk, and we're actually able to focus on choosing the best person based on their merits. This is something we can all do. Whether we're hiring someone, promoting someone, choosing people for a team or a project, we can make sure that we're evaluating diverse slates of candidates to make sure that we're actually getting the best person for the job. And that's what this is about. It's not necessarily about hiring more women or more minorities. It's about overcoming this unconscious bias, which oftentimes prevents us from hiring the best person when they're a woman or a minority. It's also really important to apply the same process at the promotion step as well. 
There's great research coming out of McKinsey that shows that the broken rung, if you will, in that ladder of success in getting women to positions of leadership is that first promotion to manager. So making sure that we evaluate diverse candidates when we're thinking about promotions will also help to address gender inequity. This sort of unconscious bias is why we have more CEOs named David than we have female CEOs. And David isn't even the most popular name for a male CEO. That's John. <laughs> this unconscious bias is also why when people were surveyed and asked to name female tech leaders, they didn't name Sheryl Sandberg or Marissa Mayer or Meg Whitman. They actually named Alexa <laughs> and, of course, Siri. We have a lot of work to do. Before we leave the world of unconscious bias, there's one other point I want to address, and really the central point of today's conversation. There are some people who will argue that while men and women may be equal from an abilities perspective, women behave differently, and it's really this behavior that's holding them back. And I can tell you I've gone into arguments and debates with other CEOs who hold this sort of perspective. Fortunately, these researchers who published in Harvard Business Review looked at exactly that. They looked at an organization where 35 to 40 percent of the entry-level workforce was female, but only 20 percent of the top two layers of leadership was female. And they looked at things like, do women not spend as much time with their managers? Do they not interface as much with senior leadership? Do they not participate in the informal networks of the organization? Are they further away from where decisions were being made? And this was a really rigorous study where they tracked who attended which meetings and who spoke up and who spoke to who. They looked at electronic communication. And you know what they found? They found virtually no difference in behavior between men and women. So the primary reason women weren't advancing is bias. It is not behavior and it is certainly not ability. Now let's transition from unconscious bias to purposeful bias. This is pseudoscience or the spread of misinformation to impact this conversation around gender equity. And a great example of that is the so-called Google memo. Now, if you haven't heard of it, this doesn't have anything to do with Google. This was a memo written by an engineer who was at Google at the time, who's no longer there, who essentially argued that women shouldn't be in leadership roles or technical roles due to underlying differences in biology. I know. I can tell you from my own leadership experience that is categorically not true, but let's actually look at the research. This has been debunked in literally thousands of studies that have looked at hard skills like math and science, but also softer skills more recently like leadership. Outside of Olympic and professional sports, which is why we have different divisions in the Olympics, there is no underlying difference in biology that would limit a girl or a woman's ability to do anything. And even when it comes to sports, we can only really see that difference at things like the Olympics, because there are a lot of amazing female athletes out there outside of the professional ranks, and being a guy doesn't predestine you to be athletic. So there, are, in fact, are a lot of girls out there that are better than their male counterparts athletically. It's only really when we compare it to something like the Olympics where you see a consistent difference in speed and power and so on. Unfortunately, this combination of unconscious bias and pseudoscience has a real impact. Let's take a look at elementary school children, which I have a couple of myself. When teachers know students' names, boys do better in math. But when the grading is anonymous, the girls actually do better. How is that possible? <laughs> math is math. As an engineer, I especially struggle with this one. <laughs> Let's grow up and go to college. If you remind students of their gender immediately prior to a math exam, the girls do dramatically worse. But if you call it a problem-solving test, the gender gap disappears. This is really important because it tells us that the pseudoscience and this unconscious bias doesn't just impact men. It impacts women as well. And so our efforts at addressing gender inequity cannot just be focused on one group or the other. We really have to target 
everyone. Now, if you're watching this or you're listening to it, probably like me, you feel like this is a really important issue and it's just the right thing to do. But let me give you some additional incentive as to why diversity makes teams and organizations better, makes us individually better, and can make our society as a whole better. When we're around people who are different from us, we tend to prepare more, we tend to anticipate alternative points of view, and we tend to realize it's going to take more effort to reach consensus. As a result of those dynamics, organizations with women on their board tend to outperform across nearly every financial metric. And papers written by diverse authors, and in the case of the study published in Scientific American, it was ethnic diversity, tend to outperform from both an impact factor and a citation perspective. When we're around people who are similar to us, we tend to feel like they know what we know, so we don't share as much. But when we're around people who are different from us, we tend to share more, and as a result, learn more and grow more. And that's why we individually benefit from diversity, and that's all types of diversity, not just gender diversity. And I cannot help but believe that if we had the full talent and imagination of 50% of the world's population, unencumbered by these biases and these obstacles, we would live in a dramatically better world. Now, I do want to caution you that diversity alone isn't enough. You know, I love this quote, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. <laughs> Take a look at the spice shaker. It is clearly diverse, but if I picked it up and I poured it over, only the salt on the top is going to come out. We have to be committed to building inclusive environments in our teams, in our organizations, in our societies, where everyone can contribute and everyone has the opportunity to reach their full potential. I do want to touch on also one other point. You probably heard me today several times talk about gender equity instead of equality. Equality is great when you're dealing with a level playing field. When you're talking about the biases and the obstacles that we've talked about here and that you're all aware of, we need more than equality. We need equity. We need to give people what they need to overcome these biases and these obstacles. So how do we do that more broadly? Well, it starts with education. Education has been and continues to be the most powerful tool in the world for change. And that's really what we spent our time on today. But we have to leverage that education for advocacy. We live in an incredible moment in time where everyone's voice truly matters and everyone has the opportunity to make a difference. And I'm really passionate about inclusive leadership. I've had the privilege throughout my career of serving in several positions of leadership and influence and I've always believed you have to leverage those positions to make a positive impact in the world in addition to delivering business results. With that mindset, as I talked about earlier, I built a company that was considered a best place for women and for diversity. I've committed to mentoring women, and I've partnered with organizations like Watermark, one of the leading organizations for the advancement of women into positions of leadership to further my personal impact. But you don't have to be a CEO. Whether you're a supervisor, a manager, a recruiter, an investor, a board member, if you're in any sort of position of influence, you can make an outsized impact on this topic of gender diversity. And if we each change our part of the world, together we can change the world. Now I want to close with a personal story. And at this point, you're probably on to me. I'm a little bit of a superhero fan. You know, I started with Captain Marvel, I'm closing with DC Superhero Girls, and I personally grew up as a big uh, Superman and Spider-Man fan. So like a lot of parents, I wanted my kids to love the things that I loved as a kid, and that shaped me as a kid, and in my case, that was superheroes. So I was able to get one of my boys into superheroes via Lego Batman, but I just couldn't really get my daughter into it, like she wouldn't sit through it. So I looked and I looked, and I came up with this. This is DC Superhero Girls, and it is awesome. And it's not just awesome for kids. It's awesome for adults, too, but I may be a little bit biased. <laughs> anyway, when I got this, my daughter actually sat down, and she watched it over and over again. And the next time her cousins and her friends came over, they didn't play princesses. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, we're huge Disney people down to my Mickey Mouse watch. 
But they actually put some capes on and flew around the house and played superheroes. And it was a great reminder that sometimes you forget or you don't realize you can get into that position in life until you see someone like you in that position. And in my daughter's case, that was superheroes, and I've gone through something like that personally and professionally as well. So that's the opportunity in front of us. We can inspire generations of girls to do anything that they can dream of, and I'm confident we can do that through education, advocacy, and inclusive leadership. So in the words of DC superhero girls, get your capes on, let's take flight. You can do anything, we can be who we like. I know that future is gonna be a reality for my daughters and for girls and women around the world. Thank you.